This is Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A show where you ask the tech questions and we hopefully give you the answers yeah, hopefully. Uh, that you want. Get your questions in, use the Ask GMBN Tech hashtag in the comments under there and we'll get underway. All right, so first up is from, I hope I pronounced this right, um, Schrodinger Wigan Grad. Uh, I recently found out about waxing your chain with paraffin wax instead of using lube. My question is, would you advise using wax on a mountain bike? I've never seen anyone doing it, um, but dealing, without dealing with oil, it's pretty good to them, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think people don't do it because it's a bit of hassle, boiling, yeah. boiling down a block of wax, etc. But you can get wax lubes. Um, there's a company in called Squirt Lube, which is actually pretty mm. good. Um, I actually... If I was taking my time to do my chain in a, like a very serious way at a race or something, I'd thoroughly degrease it, get it lined out on the counter, and put a drop of wet lube on each link, wipe it down, then get paraffin wax and do a drop of lube on each one, and then I if think, you, I think you need to hang out with John Cannings on GCN Tech. Yeah, because hear me out though, because it resists dust and muck like a wet lube. Yep. But if you take a big splash of water or you get caught out in the rain, you still have the wet lube to rely on, and it's amazing how long they run smooth for and stay quiet for. I would definitely um, be interested in trying it because I've always yeah. not bothered for the reason that it mostly rains here. Yes. It's mostly <laughs> wet yeah. and crappy yeah. and you basically your chain loop only lasts a ride anyway. But um, when you're doing a big climbing day mm. in somewhere like New Zealand where I was living, where yeah. it's really dusty, it is just so nice to have a quiet chain at the end of the day. But oh, everyone I, else I is I like... I get that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That is, yeah, that's yeah. so frustrating. Yeah. So people do use it. Yeah, people do. Um, I've not tried it. I definitely will try it if we ever get summer here. <laughs> um, and then Henry will do a video on how you can do it, I guess. Yeah, no, that'd be um, lovely. That sounds yeah, quite cool what you were talking about there. Nice. Um, next up from BBK Crescivo. Um, hello, can you explain to me how the Truvative oh, Hammersmith works? Truvative Hammersmith, this is a blast from wow, the past. Okay. Yes. Um, the guys from Truvative say it's revolutionary because you don't have typical front chainrings in derailleur. You have one chainring which gives you a ratio from 22 to 36 at the front. To me, it sounds perfect because you don't have to buy an expensive one by drivetrain, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see anyone using Hammerschmidt. What's wrong with it? Well, I mean... Where do we start? Where do we start? So, mm -hmm. just planetary gear systems are incredibly complicated things, yeah. aren't they? They're really... There's actually a story, and I can't remember the guy's name, but it was like... Is it like an Eagle planetary? <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he, um, basically, the guy that designed planetary gears got the outcome he wanted, but he could, couldn't understand how it worked, and it drove him mad. Well, so, so he built them and he didn't built know how it, they worked? And he couldn't, well, he couldn't get his head around the mathematics. That's how complicated they are. So he understood how functionally it made sense, but he never worked out the formula for how it made sense. It was, he was part of some, like, you know, European court that's, like, you know, 100 years ago, and it actually drove him mad, and that's, mm. I'm pretty sure that's a true story. But back onto the Hammerschmidt. Let's bring it back, a small tangent. Well, you must have ridden a fair few bikes. I've it? ridden Hammerschmidt loads of times, yeah. And Hammerschmidt is a great idea. Um, but what I found with it, when you go to overdrive mode, mm -hmm. um, it's just too much friction. You could mm. feel the friction you're pedaling around. Mm. The concept is amazing by having a tiny little system with basically multiple gears within that, mm. um, enhancing what you've got out the back. When I rode it, I think we were on 11 speed at the time, out the back. Yeah. Um, it was really cool, and it had a built-in bash guard and everything, but the friction for me, it wasn't enough to justify having it. I'd yeah. rather have just had a one by on the front and put up with just the 11 on the rear. I, and the cost, I guess, yes. that's right, are very expensive. Very they're expensive, like 450 yeah. quid or something like that when, when they're available. Mm. It's a lot of money. But the only time I've ever thought, wow, that's a really cool idea, is my friend had one on a single speed. Oh, yes. And so he just had it, an, e an uphill gear and a downhill gear. Yeah. And that was it. And I thought, actually, that's pretty tidy. That is trick. That's yeah. Well cool Because he just wanted a completely maintenance-free yeah. bike. Um, so I, I think we should try and get one yeah, to have a look at, one. because we haven't really sort of I, had a look inside. I remember they came out on a Marin attack trail. That's right, the green one. Yeah, and that's I what, had, That's why I had it on. I, yeah, I had that with frame, the pikes and on I the front. loved it dearly, yeah. and, um, but I, couldn't, I only bought the frame and I couldn't afford the Hammerschmidt. Yeah. And I remember lusting after the Hammerschmidt, oh my God, it's like a double, but better. <laughs> How times have changed, it's, eh? Yeah, it's, <laughs> unfortunately, it belongs on the shelf, unfortunately. So it's going to work out great for some riders, no doubt. But mm -hmm. for mass market, it just wasn't really that no. much of a hit. Yeah, cost too much, cost too much to make as well. It was heavy. Quite heavy as well. Yeah, and had friction. So whilst the concept is great, mm. rather see that inside a gearbox than... Yes. If you're going to have the friction, you may as well have the benefits of not having the rest of the drivetrain. <laughs> yeah. You may as well just have it all enclosed in sort of oil, yeah. really. Yeah. That uh, that's where we're going next, I think, with stuff. Fingers crossed. 
Okay, great one for you, Henry. This is from Greg Brown. He's got a charger damper question. He's got a 2015 RockShox Pike RCT3 with a debonair spring upgrade. Right. He's worried that his fork feels a bit slow or overdamped, even with his compression uh, rebound wound fully open. He says he's quite happy to work on a damper himself, but cool. would you recommend changing shim stacks or maybe bleeding a damper with a slightly thinner or Ooh. less viscosity oil? This is a good question. That is a good question. Um, I often found, and this is only my experience, if you had different experiences, you know, I'm not saying this is exactly how it is, mm -hmm. but in my experience, when I used to change the oil in open bath dampers, like a motion control damper, mm -hmm. the viscosity of the oil, the weight of the oil, did have a significant difference on damping. Could get that, yeah. But on a closed damper, like a, um, a charger damper, because it's already quite a thin oil in there anyway, Yeah. It's marginally different it doesn't make that much difference so right thinking the the charger dampers with the one of the bladder type yes it's a complete, completely enclosed yeah. yeah and i feel that because the oil has actually isn't going into an open space but it's also going into a, conti a continuation of the closed system it never really seemed to make that much difference going to lighter so it's about the flow rather than the yeah. viscosity of the yeah, oil yeah i itself. would say so um yeah. the thing that did make the difference is yeah shims shims do um it is a bit of a, a labyrinth, a bit of a kind of a worms going into that. But yeah. if you're happy, you know, by all means. Um, the cool thing about those 2015 dampers is they're very easy to work on. Um, I would also say if you want to get your fork a bit more fluttery, it's a bit of a different different to what you asked, but I'll say it anyway. On the negative air, there was a small bottom out spacer, which you can remove. And that's what you tend to do on kind of like, you know, if you do, do a race service on a fork, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Because that's going to aid the travel, aid the fork as it goes through its travel. So it will give it, a, get it into the mid stroke easier whilst also being nice and fluttery. Um, and what's that's. The, what's the downside to doing that? Any the, or? The downside to that is if the negative air gets too big, I guess. Well, negative air is there to overcome basically stiction in the system. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it kind of aids that. I guess if you if it was to take in two months, you'd just be banging through your travel. Um, but that's what I found in the past. Taking that bump stop out does help it feel more active. And it almost feels like there's a lighter compression tune on the fork. It wouldn't affect rebound. Um, mm. But maybe you can try it. It's a nice little. It sounds like you're really comfortable working on your forks. Yeah. It's a two-minute job to change. If, if someone was to do that on their fork at home, mm -hmm. Do I sort of understand they're going to need to keep on top of servicing more frequently to keep it feeling good? Potentially, I would say go on feel as well. If you feel like you are just like bottoming out and it's bad, then so say Rock Shock say like a fifty hour for a lower leg service today. Yeah. Um, what do they say for a damper? I don't, I think I don't it's, know what it is. I think seventy it's or something. Seven like that, yeah. Something like that. Uh, rule of thumb, of course, depending on what the conditions you ride in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like Henry says, maybe if you're comfortable, look at the shims. Yeah, shims are a good bet. Mm. All right, next up is from Elite XLR. Um, I want to change, I know if I can change my cable brake to a hydraulic brake by not changing the lever. Um, can we do that? Yeah. When, can you remember a couple of years ago when disc brakes first came to cyclocross and everyone was trying to bodge hydraulic systems onto road cable Yeah, levers. I think they're still trying to do it. They're still, <laughs> yeah, I think they are. <laughs> TRP came up with this little system that's basically a whole hydraulic system that's actuated yeah. via a cable, which proved proved quite popular. That would be your best bet, but... Do you know, do you know what? Um, they weren't the first to do it. It was oh, actually really? how it was done the first time oh, around, no way. way back in the day before road riders had even understood what brakes were for. <laughs> um, it was a company <laughs> called Mountain Cycles and they were specking pro stop brakes and they were hydraulic calipers with cable actuation. Oh, nice. And they were floating discs. And it's insane to think they were doing yeah. that in like 94. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Like, absolutely yeah. insane. And they still, by all accounts, work really well. Um, I but, but you can do that, and of course you can get cable actuated calipers as well. They're mm. never going to feel anywhere yeah. close no. to what a hydraulic caliper can. No. I guess with the system where it's all at the caliper, it it must be quite hard for it to deal with heat. Yeah. It's got a very low volume of oil in there. Yeah, and the whole point is to spread that heat out yeah. and dissipate it. Yeah, and often you'll find, you know, on Shimano brakes that suffer from it, the best performance in the big, big mountain stuff used to be the XTs, not the XTR, because mm. it was made less weight conscious, it had just a higher volume of oil in there. Um, I think that's changed now with the new ones, but a couple of generations ago, oil, oil volume is often king, really. Um, so I would say maybe just save up and go to a fully hydraulic system. I, I think you're completely right. And you say save up, but I wonder if it's probably more 
cost effective to do that anyway <laughs> yeah, 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 than it would yeah, be maybe. to get a hydraulic caliper and make that work. I think they're going to cost you more yeah. more money and it's not going to be quite as good. Yeah, as something your... like Dior's are fantastic. Dior's are amazing. If you mm. can afford to jump up to SLX, they are truly mm. fantastic brakes. Really, really good brakes. Don't cost a lot of money. They continue working pretty much forever if you look after mm -hmm. them. Um, okay, next yeah. up is from Denderman. Um, hi guys, is there any way to shorten the travel on a dropper seat post? This is a good a good question. I suppose when you get bikes, you know, if you're either on the extreme of a size, maybe have you ever any, had any issues with this dropper posts? I, being, I only want more travel. Yes, yeah, you want more travel. Yeah. I want as much as possible. I guess if you had quite a long torso and short legs, you might find that. Well, also I, I know that some cross country folk want to run a shorter travel post. And it's mm. not because they don't need need it, but it's actually more efficient to just drop it. A small amount yeah. so they can continue pedaling mm -hmm. using their leg muscles but without having a saddle kick them up the yeah. back too much. Well, true. Yeah, so there is a reason for it, mm. I think. With the bond charger seat posts, you can get little shims. They yeah. come in 10 mil increments and they're really useful. On I off think one up did a system as yeah, well. I you think can change the travel of the post. Maybe bike yoke you can. Yeah, I'm sure bike yoke make all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it really does de depend on your reverbs, you can't. KS, I don't think well, you can. Well, reverbs do do that weird silver collar that comes with them that you can, it doesn't change the, the travel of the post, but it limits the travel that you use yeah. according to where you clamp it on. So if you wanted yours to feel perhaps like an XC post with just a small yes, amount of drop, true. you could get that with a regular one, but it's not making it a short travel And as I such. would say those silver clamps are an absolute godsend. If you're ever doing a big ride with a load of you, hmm. With a lot of pedaling, take one in your backpack because if someone's seat post fails, you can sell it to them for about fifty thousand pounds. That is a good and hack. Just, we can keep it up, and then it, it just means if you've got a load of pedaling, when you only sit on it, and it goes down. Yeah. You stand up and it goes up. Yeah. So useful for a guiding pack. Really useful. That's a great, great hack. Yeah. Listen to Henry the man there. Um, all right. Next up is from uh, Faka seventy seven X. Hi tech team. With offset getting more attention, why do twenty nine forks? usually have 51 mil offset. Who decided it would be 51? <laughs> Who decided? And not 50 or 52. Uh, it was uh, my mate Craig, actually. <laughs> Same for 27 and a half. Um, all right, so the, the quick lowdown on this is it's all about your trail. So the bigger the trail measurement, and the trail is the, if you draw a line vertically from your front wheel axle and you correlate that to the head angle, that is a trail, basically the measurement there. The bigger the trail number, the more stable your handling of your steering will feel, the shorter, the more agile or nervous it might feel. Now on a 29 inch wheel bike, because you're bringing the axle up higher from the ground, it makes that larger to oh, start course, with, yeah. which is why they would give you more offset to try and reduce it, to make it feel more like a 27 and a half. But the effect of doing that on a 29 inch wheel did mean it felt um, nervous in some handling. Mm -hmm. So now people are realizing it is actually better to have slightly reduced offset. Yep. And I think people are going back as far as 42 yeah. but you, on you, some bikes. You do see, I think Sam Blenkinsop's been experimenting with you know, the lowers on his foot, sorry, or the lowers and the um, clamps on his forks. Oh, yeah. Going incredibly, incredibly stable, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, he could corner anything. You know what I mean? 100%, yeah. You know, and I think for actually your average does that aren't riding World Cup speed, yeah, it's a very different kettle of fish. My, you know? my old Scott had 51, and it's absolutely fine. Yeah, totally. There's no problem. Just because everyone's talking about it doesn't mean you need this thing right now. Yeah. If your bike feels good, enjoy it. Yeah, totally. It is. Yeah. Um, something that is important to say is if you are considering going for a less offset fork, it effectively shortens the wheelbase of your bike as well. So mm. if your bike's not especially long, don't do it. Yeah. There's no need to. Just learn to ride it as it is. Uh, and if you want you, the sort of effect of a slightly slacker front end that you can get from having a reduced offset, offset bushings, yeah. angle set, or even run less sag in your front and more on the rear. There's loads of ways around it. Yeah, and when, when people are specking bikes at OE, so original yeah. equipment, that number doesn't come across by accident. Yeah. They can choose which offset they supply. Yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, I think it was about 2015 when the rain came out, the giant rain, mm -hmm. they went to a, I think, I think it was a 51, and everyone was like, oh my God, this is cool. Yeah, you're right. You know I mean, it's, like, it, yeah. it's like an engineering thing, you know, and often, sometimes, you know, they know what they're talking about every now and then, those engineers. <laughs> So I, I think the really important thing, as you're saying there, to to adhere to is there's a lot of buzzwords used in marketing to make oh, bikes more appealing to yeah. you. And whilst they are based on facts, like shorter offset does ultimately make a slightly better performing 29er bike, it's not a reason to buy that bike. Yes. And it's not going to dramatically change your life. These are all marginal gains. Like you've got to try really hard to buy a crap bike these days. Yeah. You know, most bikes are very, very good. So we're at a really fortunate time. Yeah, pretty um, cool. Enjoy what you got. I don't think there's too much need for you to mess around with it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like, yeah. 
Crap bike's a unicycle, that's what they say. Well, unicycles are crap bikes. <laughs> it's technically not a bike, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Been ripped off if only got one <laughs> Uh, don't forget to get your comments in underneath and get any more questions for next week's show. Use that hashtag AskGMBNTech just so we know which ones are questions and we will see you next week. Um, click down there for some Camelback hacks. Yeah, and if you want to see, maybe even throw to that video I did, if you want to see that Brakes hack video, click down there. Perfect. Uh, don't forget to share and subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Cheers, guys. Cheers. <laughs>